Well, I am very excited to be joined by Mohammed Ibrahim, uh, the renowned Egyptologist and founder of the Guide of Egypt Tours, who will be hosting our Megalithic Marvels of Egypt tour uh, this February. Mohammed, thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, Dee. Hi, you're always welcome, my friend. Well, I'm so excited for our Megalithic Marvels of Egypt tour coming up this February. And uh, Mohammed, for our audience watching, Obviously, you and I want to personally invite everybody to join us uh, for the adventure of a lifetime, a 14-day expedition to see and touch the world's greatest superstructures. And uh, with you as our guide, Muhammad, not only uh, are we going to get access to the top megalithic sites, but we're going to learn deeper truths regarding uh, the pre-dynastic history of Egypt. We will see two types of sites in this tour. We are going to see types, type A, uh, what I call it, regular type that all the uh, the other tours can go, like the Great Pyramid, or Giza Plateau, Karnak, uh, Luxor Temple, Valley of the King, Hatshepsut, uh, Aswan, Fila Island, uh, the Quarry of uh, the, uh, the Rose Granite. Uh, but we are not going to go to the same corners and the same spots in these sites. Yes, we are going to visit Karnak and Billions of people visited Karnak before. But I can promise you, I will take you to some places inside Karnak Temple. No one else uh, had the chance to see it or to visit. Uh, Muhammad, I know a lot of people have some questions about traveling to Egypt. How safe is Egypt? What if, uh, what if the tour gets canceled due to travel restrictions with COVID? Um, PCR tests. Can you just answer those questions real quick for people who have these questions? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, look, uh, I'm doing tours for the last six months now. Not only me, but uh, all the uh, travel agencies in Egypt. And everything is uh, completely safe. Uh, we provide people like just uh, normal uh, procedures with masks and we have alcohol available on the bus all the time. Uh, the uh, hotels also are um, put in very high standards for hygiene and for uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the requirements of the Egyptian Ministry of Health. Okay, so you'll find that everything in, in a very good shape. So uh, in the last six months, everything is almost perfect or is perfect. Okay, there is no problem about COVID-19. So we miss our people that they are not going to lose their money. Uh, if they close, uh, they close airports or they ban travels, they have two options to keep their money for a future trip. We will announce about it when everything will calm down again without any fees. Or they can uh, receive their refund. And in this case, they will uh, lose the, uh, the amount for the domestic flights. We cannot uh, uh, get that from Egypt Air. But if we get this, we will send it to them, which is $200 per person. About uh, BCR test, if you uh, are planning to join Egypt, they, the Egyptian government does not require a uh, vaccine. Uh, what is all required is uh, uh, traveling BCR test, and of course the result be negative. And the BCR must be done for three days uh, before traveling. Uh, when you and you must have a printed uh, copy uh, in your hand when you come to Cairo Airport. Uh, some people they bring it on their cell, cell phone. Now it is uh, uh, recommended to have uh, a printed copy. And when the tour is done, uh, we will also uh, will help you. We will get you uh, a nurse to make the uh, the BCR test in the field, okay, uh, to be the uh, as possible uh, as easy as possible. And they will take also a printed copy uh, with you to travel out of Egypt. Uh, the price of the uh, PCR test in Egypt nowadays about 60 US dollars. Okay. Also about getting the visa. Uh, most of the Western nationalities can get the entry visa of Egypt from Cairo airport. So you don't need to contact any embassy, uh, either in the one in New York or London or in any place in uh, your homeland. Now you can fly to Cairo airport. My assistant will uh, meet you, will help you to get the visa, which costs uh, again 25 US dollars in cash. 
Okay, they don't take uh, credit cards. $25 in cash. Uh, so what I want to do now with the time we have left is ask you about uh, several of the ancient sites we're going to see on our tour this February. And again, for our audience, um, you can go to megalithicmarvels.com forward slash tours to uh, uh, learn more about this tour and reserve your spot. And uh, I think it's pretty affordable at $4,500 US compared to a lot of other tours I see. So uh, go there and get more information uh, and sign up today. So Mohammed, I'm super excited about um, going to see the Great Pyramid. And uh, I think we're going to get a private visit inside. It's going to be two hours long. It's after hours. We're going to get to see the subterranean chamber and the so-called Queen's Chamber and King's Chamber. So I got to ask you, um, can you kind of give us some of your latest theories regarding the Great Pyramid, um, how old it might be, and what are you leaning towards was its major purpose? I'm going to answer this question, but let me first give you a quick list of what we're going to see. We are going to visit sites. Uh, most of the people don't see it, and most of the people don't know about it, like Tanis, uh, Tanis City, Northeast Egypt. This is a, a, a huge site, and uh, the uh, the power and the energy of, of these sites, the two sites in Tanis, or one is Tal Basta for uh, the uh, the cat busted, and the second is Tanis. Uh, the energy is great because less people means more energy. List of negative energies from the visitors means very positive, very high positive energies from the site. And also we're going to visit Moot Temple. This is a site temple near Karnak. We're going to visit the Ramasium, the temple which uh, housed the biggest statue all over the world. The statue of, unfortunately, we have to call it this way, statue of Ramses II, according to the writings, which weighs 1,000 tons. We're going to see a statue with the weight of 1,000 tons, one piece of rose granite, okay? And so many other places. About the uh, Great Pyramid, yes, I love when it comes to the private visit, because private visit means that we are going to be alone, only our group, nobody else, no vendors, no other tours, no other groups, minimum number of security. Uh, we will be alone uh, renting the entire area, not only the Great Pyramid, by the way, we will be alone inside the entire of Giza Plateau. So imagine the, uh, the energy which we are going to be, uh, is going to be for ourselves only. And with the permission, we will be able to spend two hours inside the Great Pyramid. And as you said, yes, we are going to see uh, behind the closed doors. They're going to open the iron door for the so-called Queen's Chamber, and also they will open the closed door for Brynjian. According to my friend Christopher Dunn, one of the functions of the Great Pyramid is to produce energy, and it could be electric energy. So he called his first Giza power plant. And I agree about this 100%. But I can add to this that the pyramid have, has so many functions. And in our tour, we will talk about these functions. But we can mention something extra that the pyramid also is, was, was used for communication. The pyramid was producing microwaves. And these microwaves can... Uh, not can, it is used nowadays for uh, communications. Uh, our cell phones are uh, depending on microwaves or these uh, towers dealing or uh, the, uh, using microwaves to send uh, the frequencies and the signals. Okay. How old is the, the Greek pyramid? If I ask you the question and ask everybody, how old is the Egyptian civilization? The first group will tell you the Egyptologist will tell you uh, 3,500 BC, according to so many evidences. Yes, true. But then another group will jump in until you know it is 5,000 BC, according to pre-dynastic Egyptians. That is true. The third group will jump in and say, no, it is 8,000 BC, according to early pre-dynastic, and we call it Fayyum culture. That is also true. 
And then another group will jump in, especially it will be Belgium group from a Belgium university, but I forgot the name. They will say, we found a skeleton in a place called Kubaniya near Aswan. That skeleton is uh, 18,000 years old. It is between 18 and 25,000 years. According to carbon-14, it was carbon-dated. 18 to 25,000 BC. That's it. Now, there is another group, and also Belgium will jump in and will say, we found a skeleton uh, in a place called Neslet Khater near Abydos and it was carbon dated and it is 35,000 BC. And the third Bel Belgium group will say there was a skeleton of a child about eight to 10 years old was found in a place called Taramsa, uh, Taramsa near Dandara in uh, South Asia. And it is 55,000 BC. And that uh, a skeleton was found in a, a place looks like a workshop of flint, okay? And then other groups will jump in and the, one of them will say, no, the Egyptian civilization is 150,000 years old based on uh, flint tools we found and it is similar to some other places in Europe. Uh, another group will tell you, no, it is 200,000 and then 300,000. 600,000 BC, according to some tools, were found uh, on the uh, mountains of the Valley of the Kings. 600,000, okay? And these types of tools, they call it uh, Acholian tools uh, related to that place in France called Saint Achol. So we have tools, according to science, it says uh, that there was human existed 600,000 BC and they made these tools. That, I, by the way, I am writing, I'm, out, I'm almost finished my book, and that is my first book, by the way, I'm gonna write so many. And that was the latest date I reached. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, I was going to end the story till here, 600,000 BC. But I visited the uh, Civilization Museum which is opened recently in Egypt. And I found they put a label of the, these types of flint and tools. And they mentioned uh, the 600,000 uh, BC tools, not as the last one, as the pre-last one, okay? So there is an older uh, type of tools. Uh, and then, I remembered uh, my journey to Siwa Oasis in North uh, West Asia. And the Bedouins were taking us, uh, it was a four by four uh, car. And we went very deep at the uh, Grand Sahara Desert. And he took us to a place and he pointed at uh, a certain area. It looks very old. And he told me, uh, look, Mr. Muhammad, so I said, what? I saw foot, uh, feet, uh, footprints and feet prints for human, for goats and for a snake, okay? He told me that, and again, it is German or Belgium uh, expedition. He told me the, uh, the archeologist said, they, these are two million years old. So I was like, you know, that kind of, okay, maybe he was exaggerating, okay, it's like, but maybe like 350, okay? I was in between. I didn't uh, deny this, but also it was like too much to accept this or to digest this information. And then so many facts and so many information similar to this was uh, told, to, were told to me by keepers and by uh, guards of the sites until I made that visit the Civilization Museum. I found that the pre-last uh, classification saying 600,000 BC, is, there was a type of a tool, big flint, with a sharp edge, okay, they call it an ax, okay, or like an, a heavy weapon, and the official label, not me, okay, I'm talking about the official label, 2.3 million BC. 
imagine that the, there is a museum in Egypt admits that there was human 2.3 2, 2. million BC and they made tools. So now, guess what? If we talk about the uh, dynasties and if we agree that they made this great civilization, pre-dynastic primitive people were like 5,000 before them, okay? Now we are talking about 2.3 million. So all these millions of years, they were uh, stuck with flint. They didn't develop, okay? It doesn't make sense. So we have at least every 5,000 years, and if we can add four extra, so we are talking about 9,000 years, we must have a civilization from zero to the top and then back to it. But if we go to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the idea or the uh, theory of what we call it, the cycle of the sun or the grand year, it talks about uh, 24,000 years, uh, 12,000 uh, civilization and development and 12,000 the curve will decline, okay? Uh, so we have, and, and this is also one of the uh, presentations I'm gonna do in the tour, the five cycles of the sun, okay? Cycle one, Kibber, cycle two, Ra, cycle three, Atom, cycle four, Atom, and cycle four is the uh, end of the last civilization on Earth, 10,500 BC with the solar disaster that with the time when uh, the uh, Egypt and all the humans lost their civilization. And then 9,700 BC was the end of the ice age and the cataclysm. And in my opinion, it was not a disaster. It was a well clean earth. It was cleansing, not destruction. And right after the, uh, the end of the last ice age, humans started to rise again and 9,000 BC, we had Fayyum culture and so on, all the later cultures, the uh, first dynasty and then the uh, Egyptian dynasties. Okay, so back to the question, how old did the Egyptian, how old is the government? Uh, I will show you and the participants of this tour that the pyramid was there during 9,700 BC. It was not built during the time, it was already there and uh, was destroyed, uh, the same as you see it now, but it was there 9,700 BC. So how old it is? It's older than 9,700 BC. So it could be 20,000 BC, it could be 80,000 BC. And, and maybe this is my favorite answer, that the pyramid is at least 80,000 BC. During the tour, we will see how I came up with this opinion. Okay. Wow, that's incredible possibly 80,000 years old or older, really, BC. Wow. Okay, so we're going to also explore on our tour what's known as the Valley Temple and see the massive precision stones there. And then I think we're going to take a visit inside the enclosure of the Sphinx, where we can literally stand in between its paws and we can see the water erosion in the enclosure. Uh, first, I want to ask you about what do you think was going on with the what we call the Valley Temple. Uh, what was that, what was its purpose, you think? Okay, uh, if you wanna, the, the main purpose of each site in Egypt, or one of the main purposes of the site is healing. So Karnak Temple, Luxor Temple, the Pyramids, uh, Sakkara, Dandara, Hila, uh, Isis Temple, all of them are uh, serving uh, healing purposes. And, and then other functions, okay? So if we talk about healing, how you receive this energy? Nowadays, we go inside the pyramid to feel it, but that is not the proper thing. Now we do this because the pyramid is turned it off, shut down, okay? But if the machine is on, okay, we shall not get close to the machine. We go to a safe spot where the energy will come to us. So that is the location of the Valley Temple. So the Valley Temple is where the people used to uh, go, okay, and together uh, and to receive the energies in that place. Getting closer was dangerous, actually, not helpful for them. So 
So the valley temple is the place where the locals used to go for the healing. The water erosion that we see in the Sphinx enclosure, again, um, I assume that you would agree that that means it's much older than uh, mainstream Egyptologists would say. Tell us a little bit about uh, Robert Schock and the, the water erosion. And then what do you think the original um, face of the Sphinx was? Okay, uh, the first fact we must know about Egypt, and we used to study this all the time. Egypt is dry, dry wizard. Egypt is dry wizard. And not only dry wizard, but we can say that one of the one of the driest uh, uh, environments in the whole world is Egypt. Okay, can I repeat that again? Because many people don't know this. Even the Egyptians didn't tell us. The most dry weather in the whole world, okay, are like five places, including Egypt. So Egypt is very dry weather, and if you visit Egypt, you'll find that Egypt is almost uh, square, 1,000 meters each side, okay? 7% uh, of Egypt is the Nile and Green uh, Valley, okay? And 93% are desert. Is that the case during the modern time? No, it was the case in Egypt in the last 10,000 years, okay? Or 12,000 years, exactly. That was the case. So Egypt, 5,000 years ago, was also dry wizard. 7,000 years ago, also dry wizard. 9,000 years ago, also dry wizard. Who is saying this? Muhammad, Egyptologist? No. Science, geologist, uh, professional geologist, like Robert Schock. So how come we have these severe erosions and chops alongside the uh, enclosure wall of the Sphinx, if we are talking about this dry weather. And truly, if you come to Egypt and stay the whole year in Egypt, from January to January next year, you will barely witness any uh, rain in Egypt. It rains like 10 minutes maximum, three times a month or three times during the winter time, and that's it, okay? We, we don't know what does it mean, heavy rain. There is no heavy rain, it is like some uh, uh, water to just wet the ground, and that's it. Okay. So, what is the the uh, the chance or the possibility that we can have this kind of rain in Egypt? It was the rainy season at the end of the last ice age, again nine thousand seven hundred BC or before. That's why we call it last ice age. It was several ice ages before this one. So, if our latest uh, open or latest uh, chance. So it could be this one, the one before, or the one before, or the one before. So Robert Schock, when he said 9,700 BC, he said, in my opinion, he, he, he should put this, that this is the, the latest thing this could happen. So it could happen also 20,000 BC, 40,000 BC, I'm, I'm not very sure exactly about the timing, but something like this, okay? Uh, because these fissures and these erosions cannot happen during the natural weather of Egypt. Also, when we look to the head of the Sphinx, it is very small in compare with the body and in compare with the normal size of other Sphinxes. Like we will see at the Egyptian Museum, uh, Sphinx for Hatshepsut, Moses III, we'll see that the proportion of the, the head is okay uh, in compared with the body. But the great Sphinx and Giza, no, it is very small like a sesame seed, especially when you see it from the other side, from the north side, okay? Not only this, but also the quality of the stone of the head is much better than the body, which is also something uh, not logical. Why? because the body was always covered with sand and the head was always exposed to air and wind and uh, sand storms and rain, okay? E even if there's little rain, but still uh, can affect because the quality of the stone at the Sphinx, the, the limestone is not good quality, okay? So the opposite must happen, the head in a poor condition and the body in a good condition.
but we, we see that this is not the case. So the solution is that this head was one day a complete lioness with the head of a lioness and the whole body is a big lioness. And then during the dynasties, maybe Khufu or Kifrin or later, they chiseled the head to make it human head, the, the same features of the king. That's why they chiseled the eroded ears and they brought new skin to the, the head and the feet. And that, that the only reason can be accepted the, the face and the head looks better conditioned than okay. so that is the, the story uh, of Dr. Robert Schock and most of the uh, uh, people last who believe in uh, such stories and Mohammed, do you know uh, is there any truth to the rumors that there could be uh, some kind of secret entrance or chamber on, uh, underneath the Sphinx that there are not rumors anymore, my friend, because there are so many evidences now proving this. Uh, Edgar Casey Foundation had a permission to work at the Sphinx uh, in 1990 something, 1993, maybe 94, at this. So how come the man made his prediction and then his foundation got a permission to continue uh, or to prove his story? Number two, Again, according to Dr. Robert Chuck and John Anthony West, they used the penetrated radar and they found that there is a small room under the left bow of the Sphinx, about two by three, maybe. Okay. And they didn't have the chance to continue their work. So now, for sure, we know that there is a space under the left bow of the Sphinx. Recently, they showed us, or we know for sure now, I'm going to send you the pictures, that there is a small opening, like a small window, at the back side of the Sphinx, okay, from the side of the Sphinx, or what we call it north. And that uh, window or hole leads to, uh, to two tunnels. One goes up to, like, be through the tail of, of the Sphinx, through the body of the Sphinx, okay? And the second one goes down for about uh, two meters or three meters down, and then a horizontal tunnel for about 15 meters. So for sure, there are tunnels under this thing. Also, there is a hole on top of the head covered with an iron door, another hole at the back side behind the neck, and one at the front. The one at the front maybe is not deep. It is about uh, short, um, opening okay and this is the only one i could see if you just uh, uh, put your neck higher behind the stela you can see that door but the one at the top the one behind the neck definitely leads to uh, tunnels uh, inside the body of the sphinx and why i believe this now because i saw that the tunnel i'm telling you about now from the left side which goes into the body of the sphinx okay so talking about uh, chambers under the Sphinx, it is true. Talking about us under the Sphinx, it is also true. But my guessing that we are not going to find any written secrets or records. My guessing that we are going to find designs and patterns. And all the secrets will be inside these patterns and designs. And if we manage to understand the relationships uh, uh, between them, like in mathematics and like chemistry, we will uh, know so many uh, important uh, secrets and uh, important information from the past. Incredible. I want to ask you about one more site before uh, we hang up the call here, Mohammed. A uh, site I'm really looking forward to. This is a site that amazes me the most, or one of the, one of the sites that amazes me most in Egypt, and that is the Serapium and the black boxes that are found underneath. Um, this place is amazing. It's very mystical. It's this huge subterranean complex. And uh, these boxes are massive. I believe with the lid, they weigh about 100 tons. Uh, tell us about these, these black boxes. I know mainstream Egyptology says, oh, they were just boxes that were created to house the sacred bulls. But there's got to be so much more to this. Tell us your thoughts on these boxes. 
Of course, and, and yes, I agree with you. This is the, one of the most amazing sites, not only inside Egypt, but in the whole world, in the whole galaxy, by the way. <laughs> um, we must understand that it is not only uh, when we talk about this place, we must talk about the, the tunnel itself. The tunnel itself is, is a kind of, if we talk about primitive technologies, so this is a miracle. Okay, but if we talk about advanced technologies, so this tunnel can be done easily, like our machines now doing the subways under the cities and underground. Okay, uh, so to do this tunnel, we need that big machine, that round machine uh, creates tunnels under the ground. Uh, about the boxes, we have almost 23 uh Pots inside or pots of, uh, under the ground inside the strapi. Uh, the average weight uh, is from 70 to 100 tons because they are not all the same size. Okay. Uh, so 70 to 100 tons. Uh, the, the, the box itself is uh, from 50 to 70 and the lead from 20 to 30 tons, which is too much, too much for labels and too much for uh, humans. These are regular humans or even strong humans because we are talking about uh, uh, inner places under the, uh, the ground and also limited spaces. And by the way, one of the uh, things we managed to discover because of the, the tiny, uh, some of the boxes are in what we call it unfinished uh, shape. They are not polished. They are not perfectly done yet. Some others are perfectly done and they are uh, in a great shape. So what happened? Why these boxes are not finished? So we understand that they didn't finish them at the workshop. They're going to finish them inside the strapping. But when you look to the space in between, between the wall of the room and the, and the box, it's very small. Like a small child can walk through, only a small child. A right? person my size cannot go in between. So how are they going to finish it? How are they going to make it polished? So this brings us uh, the story of nanotechnology. So we are not talking about advanced technology only, but also we are talking about advanced tiny tools or nanotechnology. Okay. Number two, what is the function of the serapium? The serapium to bury the, the sacred abyss pool? No, of course not. Okay. Because for a very simple reason, can a, a, a regular civilization like the dynasties, can, can they produce these type of stones or these types of boxes without advanced uh, technology? And when I say advanced technology here, I'm talking about at least technology similar to what we have nowadays, at least. So it could be better, much better than what we have, okay? So the minimum of the ancient Egyptian true technology, the minimum of them is the maximum we have now, okay? So, and again, according to Christopher Dunn, uh, he mentioned this in his book, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, that he sent a message to one of the factories dealing with marble and granite, asking them to do a box like this and how much is, it is going to cost, okay, from one single piece of stone. They replied and they said, we're going to make it five pieces, base and four walls. He said, no, I'm talking about one solid single piece. Then they refused the project. And if I am them, I will refuse the project. This project is against... Uh, uh, logic and against, uh, how do you call it, business-wise, okay? Because when you cut inside, okay, and then you have to have a huge uh, uh, volume of stones, you can, and it, it is ready, so you can break the stone, uh, kind of a crack can happen. So it means that this project now is failed. So you lost money, you lost time, you lost material. So you have to do it again. And maybe the second time also can something can happen. Okay, it is very risky operation. The only 
think you will do this uh, will will give you the chance to to do this and w- you will not be afraid of having mistakes if you have super technology technology can tell you do it with no fear okay as if you are a uh, scuba scrape you are not drilling you are not using uh, uh, mechanical hammers okay uh, to cut this some people do, is, are talking about uh, using water jet the water jet will not be effective because it is very deep level it we are talking about the depths of 2 meters inside the box uh water jet is dealing with 2 centimeters maybe maximum 4 centimeters now maybe they developed uh, some uh, water jet machine but still cannot go 2 meters deep and we need another uh, tool to cut uh, the, the base and to make the base so it will not cut only vertically three boxes and there are some empty uh, rooms and uh, three uh, boxes are unfinished okay and it seemed that that was not enough the another extension was recently found 2012 and in that extension there is a bigger box so we are talking about 70 and 100 tons no there is my friend a bigger size in that uh, new extension it is almost 150 tons because it is almost twice bigger than the normal uh, boxes in the main uh, therapy okay so what is the function the function here is very complicated some people say that this stones are the battery or these stones are the catalyst to energize the batteries okay some people call it uh, portals and star gates um and guess what i believe in all of these opinions okay we will talk uh, in a very wide scale about uh, these opinions when we are uh, in this therapy with them Uh, Mohammed, I know you're on vacation, so I want to honor your time and end this. But uh, this has been an insightful interview. And uh, for the Megalithic Marvels audience watching, Mohammed and I personally want to invite you to join us uh, for the Megalithic Marvels of Egypt tour this February. It's going to be incredible. And you can go to megalithicmarvels.com forward slash tours uh, to reserve your spot. Uh, Mohammed, thank you so much. And we will see you in February. You're welcome, Dee. And yes, I'm preparing so many good stuff and presentation for our audience and our participants.